Right now, I want you to take a moment to consider what bitter experiences have you encountered recently? Um, I know a handful in our church have gotten sick. Uh, some COVID, like another wave, has been spreading around. Um, raise your hand if you know somebody that's gotten COVID in the last few weeks. Yeah, everybody. Um, we've, had, we've had people in our church family who have lost a loved one, others who have lost a job. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Are you encouraged yet? <laughs> In this world, you will have trouble. As long as we are in this world, we're going to experience some painful, difficult things, right? Sickness, loss, disappointment. But in the midst of those challenges, the most bitter experiences, God is present. This morning, we're going to look at a story in the Bible where God, he reveals himself to his people when things were bitter. Like literally bitter, actually, to the taste. Um, their, their water, it was foul, it was undrinkable, like worse than L.A. tap water, probably. Maybe. I don't know. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I thought it was kind of funny that this happened, not really funny when it happened in the moment, but given what we're talking about this morning, uh, yesterday morning I'm working out in my garage and my water bottle was empty and rather than going inside to fill it up, we had some gallon plastic water jugs in my garage and so I open up one of those jugs and I just start chugging. Um, any of you chuggers? Uh, or have you ever been in that place where like you're so thirsty that you just drink so much until your stomach almost hurts? Um, that's me, that's what I was doing, so I'm just chugging away, and then I don't notice until like my last gulp, I set the thing down, the most like worst plasticky, like chemically taste in this really foul aftertaste. So I don't know if like the jugs were in the garage got really hot and like the plastic just melted into it or what happened, um, but it was terrible. And within a couple minutes, I started to feel super sick to my stomach. So sick that I stopped my workout, I poured all the rest out on the grass out in the front yard. I'm like, nobody else needs to accidentally drink some of this. And then I went up to my bedroom, I laid down, and I just, like, I had to fall asleep for like, I, I don't know, I laid there for like an hour and a half. Um, I felt terrible. And I imagine that my experience there may have been similar to the water that the Israelites had in our story. It was bitter, it was undrinkable, uh, probably to make you feel well. And so if you brought a Bible, you can go open with me to Exodus chapter 15. That's where our story is this morning, Exodus chapter 15. There's a lot of great English translations of the Bible. If you want to track with me and follow along, I'll be reading out of the NIV, the New International Version. There's a free Bible app if you don't have a Bible with you, and if you don't want to download that, that's okay. We'll have uh, everything up here on the screen for you. But we're continuing our series this morning that we've titled, My Friends Call Me. And we're looking at each week at one of the different names of God that we find in the Bible. And we see that as God's people, as they walked with him and had relationship with him, they would experience different trials or challenges just like you and me. They experienced these challenges, and in those situations, God would reveal himself. He would make his presence known. He would reveal some different aspect of his nature and his character. And then that's where we would get these names of God, either something that God spoke and revealed or something that somebody said, oh, my gosh, you are El Roy, you are the God who sees me, or you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides for me. Um, and this morning, we're going to look at the particular way that God chooses to reveal himself when things are bitter. When things are bitter. Here's some context in Exodus 15. I'm going to paint a bigger picture for you. Uh, so after being slaves in Egypt for 430 years, how long have you been alive? Okay, 430 years, long time. This is all this nation is known for generations is being enslaved in Egypt. And God, he miraculously frees his people, the Israelites. He sends Moses to Pharaoh and he says, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh responds and he wasn't having it. He tells Moses, who's the Lord that I should obey him? I don't know the Lord and so I'm not gonna obey his command to let them go. But little did Pharaoh know that God was going to make sure Pharaoh knew who he was. So God reveals himself. He demonstrates his power by sending these ten plagues on Egypt that completely destroy the land. One thing at a time, just in succession. So first he turns all the water in Egypt, all the water in the Nile River to blood. All the fish die. People can't drink it. Then he sends a plague of frogs. Frogs in the street, frogs in your closet, frogs everywhere. Then he sends a plague of gnats. Then flies. Then all the livestock, all the animals that belonged to the, the Egyptians, they died. But God spared all of his people to make a distinction, all their animals. Then God sends boils that break out on everybody's skin. Then a massive hailstorm. Then locusts come and they eat up anything that the hail didn't damage. 
Then there was a plague of darkness so that nobody, imagine, you can't see, like literal darkness, not just like a little bit, but nobody could see or move for three days, it said. That's nine of the plagues, nine of the ten. And after every single one of those plagues, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh calls in Moses and he says, I want you to please pray to your God that he would stop this plague. Get these frogs out of here, get these gnats out of here, whatever it is. And Moses would say, okay, I'll pray to him for you if you agree to let his people go. And he says, yeah, I'll let them go. Just pray that they, you know, that God would take this away. So Moses prays, God removes whatever it is, and Pharaoh changes his mind. Every time changes his mind, and then hence why the next plague would come, and then the next plague. But then came the last plague, death to the firstborn. Every firstborn child, every firstborn animal, except for the people of Israel. If you remember the story, God tells Moses to instruct the Israelites, I want you to slaughter a lamb, and I want you to take some of the blood and put it on the door frames of your house. And then when the angel of death comes and passes over that night, any of the homes that have that blood on the door frame, he will pass over and spare the people inside. That's where we get the name Passover and the Jewish feast of Passover. And so that night, the angel of death passes over all those Israelite homes with the blood on their doorposts. And Pharaoh wakes up the next morning and his son is dead. And that's it for Pharaoh. He finally commands the Israelites to leave. Just get out of here. I don't want to ever see you again. And the Israelites, they leave. And as they exit out of Egypt and they're, they're ex exiting out of the city and all this, this place, Pharaoh realizes, okay, we just lost, him and his officials, his officials realize they just lost their entire labor force. The land is destroyed and we have no one to work it. We don't want to do it ourselves. We just made a huge mistake. So he gathers the entire army, 600 chariots, and they go after the people of Israel. The Israelites, they reach the edge of the Red Sea and then they look behind them and here comes Pharaoh's army coming over the hill. And they're trapped. They're freaking out. What in the world are we going to do? God sends a pillar of fire to come in between the Israelite people and the Egyptian army to protect them. But they're still crying out, what are we going to do? We're trapped. We've got fire now on one side and the army and then we've got the, the Red Sea on the other. They're crying out to God, what are we going to do? And Moses, as he's praying, God tells him, I want you to take the staff that's in your hand, the same one that you put in the Nile and it turned to blood. I want you to take that staff and I want you to go put it in the Red Sea. He puts it in the Red Sea and immediately God begins to drive back the waters and with walls of water on each side, the entire nation of Israel, you got men, women, children, the elderly, everybody is walking through on dry ground, passing over. And just as the Israelites are coming out the other side, God removes the fire that was keeping back the Egyptian army. The Egyptian army sees this is their chance. I don't know if I would follow the Israelites in if I'm seeing these walls. But they follow in. The entire army chases them. And right after the last Israelite person steps onto dry ground, God causes the waters to come back in and every single one of their enemies is drowned. When we reach Exodus chapter 15, the Israelites, they're standing on the other side of the Red Sea and they're free. For the first time in 430 years as a people, they're free. And so they sing this big worship song led by Moses' sister Miriam. And have you ever been in a stadium filled with people who are singing the same song? It's like enough to give you goosebumps, right? Like, so I want you to imagine that time, mul that multiple times over, that same kind of feeling. The entire nation, they all lift up their voices, and they're not just singing it like it's their yell. They are passionate in worship because God, look at what he just did for us. They are celebrating. We are free. And so they're all just erupting in praise together. One of the most beautiful moments of worship that we read about in the entire Bible. But then we come to verse 22. That's where we're going to pick it up. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what do we to drink? <laughs> then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them, and he put them to the test. He said... 
If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what's right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. In Hebrew, he tells Moses, I am Jehovah Rapha. Tell the person next to you, Jehovah Rapha is the God who heals you. So it's been three days that they've been free. Only three days since they experienced that powerful moment of worship altogether. But as they're traveling through the wilderness on the other side of the Red Sea, they can't find any water. And three days go by. Everyone's parched. They're barely hanging on. How long have you gone without drinking water? I've never made it close to three days. I haven't made it a day. They're barely hanging on at the end of three days. And I imagine, so they, they finally come to this place called Mara, and they see water. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, we finally found it. I imagine the first person goes over and they just start drinking immediately. <laughs> spits it all over the ground. This is disgusting. I imagine a couple other people try it because they're so desperate. Same thing, spewing it all over the place. This is terrible. They call the place Mara, which means bitter because the water is bitter. Have you ever noticed that after God reveals himself to you, after he blesses you or he sets you free, that it's not very long afterwards that trial comes, that your faith is tested? I had this roommate in Bible college, and we shared this apartment together, and we were poor, poor college students. We got like all of our, all of our furniture we got for free off Craigslist. Um, that free page on Craigslist was like my favorite thing. Um, we were living off Top Ramen, and because we were poor, like, we, we were, tried to be careful about running the heat and the AC, right? But my roommate, he would get up really early to go to work in the mornings, and in the wintertime, it was freezing cold, and so he would turn the heat on, which was fine. But sometimes he would forget to turn it off, and so I would come out, and it would just be, like, really hot in our place, and so I would text him, I'm like, dude, please, like, I'm not trying to pay for this, make sure you turn it He's like, oh, yeah, sorry, dude, I'll just, I'll take care of that, I'm sorry. We have a couple of these conversations, and then you fast forward about a week, and I wake up early in the morning, and I have the most amazing time with God. I re I'm reading my Bible, and praying, and worshiping in my bedroom, and like, it was amazing. Like, I was filled with so much joy and excitement. I'm like, man, God, you're amazing. I'm excited for today. And I open my door to go out, and the heat hit me like a ton of bricks. I look over at the thermostat on the wall, and it was like a knob, a dial like this. It was turned past like the 100. It felt like 1,000 degrees in there. And so I'm like fuming. I send off like the angriest text. I'm like, what the heck is your problem? We just talked about da, 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 da. I grab my backpack for school and I head out the door. I slam it behind me and I go and I sit in my car and I'm just like, Argh. and all of a sudden it hit me. Two minutes ago, I was like, God, you're amazing. What the heck happened to me? Like the Israelites, I think we can, or I'll speak for myself, I can be quick to lose sight of all that God has done for me, everything that he's doing or has done, and zero in on that one bitter thing that's happening in my life and allow it to consume me. And we grumble. We allow the heat out there to ignite our temper in here. We allow the bitterness of the situation out there to creep into our heart. And here we read about the Israelites, their heart has turned bitter and they're grumbling against Moses. When are we going to drink? And notice Moses' response. What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. Here's a leadership lesson for you. When you're in a situation at work or at school or at home and everybody's looking to you maybe for an answer or just to see how you're going to respond, take it to God. Like Moses, pray. That's where your answer is going to come. The water's bitter. Everybody's grumbling against Moses. And then when Moses prayed in verse 25, it says that the Lord showed him a piece of wood. And we're not sure Moses' process, like if he just knew in his spirit, like I'm supposed to throw that in the water. Or if like God gave him instructions, we don't know exactly what happened, but God shows him the wood. And Moses, he throws it into the water as God instructs or whatever. And the water, it miraculously turns into Dasani. It's like this beautiful, delicious water, right? The problem is now solved. All these thirsty people, this entire nation, they can now drink as much as they wanted. And immediately after the Lord healed the waters of Mara, he identified himself. He said, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. Isn't this amazing? Beyond the miracle itself, what's wild to me is how God responded. He blessed a bunch of grumblers. 
Remember, like he had just freed them from slavery, all the plagues, he miraculously parts the Red Sea, and in less than three days, they go from worship to like, you know, this water is nasty. Moses, what are we supposed to drink? We're thirsty. As our leader, like, what are you going to do for us? What the heck? And God, man, if I was God, I'd probably just blast them all right there. You can be thankful I'm not God. Moses cries out to God, and he's like, what am I supposed to do with these people? And instead of telling Moses, hey, step back, I got him, and just raining down some fire from heaven or something like that, instead he extends mercy. God filled these ungrateful, complaining mouths with sweet, refreshing water. This is one of the most amazing things to me about God. Jesus put it this way in Luke 6.35. He said, he's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Man, I get mad when I hold the door open for somebody and they don't say thank you. Or you let somebody get in front of you in traffic and like they don't do any, they don't, any no acknowledgement. When people are ungrateful, it's like, but God, he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. This is our God. Jehovah Rapha, so kind, so loving. He heals the bitter water so his people can experience relief from their chapped lips, their dry mouths, and live. What bitter thing are you experiencing? What's causing grumbling or complaining in your heart? Maybe it's a situation at work that's getting under your skin. Maybe it's an issue at home, robbing you of joy. Maybe it's your health. We live in a broken world. We face these situations like the Israelites, and if we're not careful, These things can cause us to drift from worship. We experience these bitter things that cause us to get bitter. So what bitter thing is it for you that you're experiencing? Jehovah Rapha is here. The God who heals you is present. The God who makes bitter things sweet. I just want to, would you close your eyes for just a second, and would you just invite him, if there is a space that came to mind for you, an area of your life, would you just invite him into that space right now? Just tell him, Jehovah Rapha, God, I need you. Invite him, God, invite, please, just invade this bitterness around me. Take any of it from my heart. Heal me. Bring me back to the place of worship and to gratitude. God, we invite you. Come. You can open your eyes. Romans 8.28 says that, and we know, we're confident of this, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You could put it this way, that you're going to encounter sickness, you're going to encounter bitter things that aren't good. But we serve a God who works them together for our good, even when you don't deserve it. Even when you're just grumbling and complaining. God's love is greater than your grumbling. He's the God who heals you, not because you're worthy of healing, but because it's what his name is. It's who he is. It's in his character, in his nature. I am the God who heals you, and he will never change who he is. He is immutable, incapable of change. This is good news. So back to the story for a minute. I want to look at something that I find fascinating. God shows Moses a piece of wood. Why a piece of wood? Jesus once told the Pharisees in John 5, 39, he said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you find life, but I'm telling you the scriptures, they point to me. Jesus is saying everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is actually about me. We saw it in previous weeks, right? Every week we're seeing that the greatest expression of every name of God, we see it in Jesus. Jehovah Jireh, the whole story of God being our provider was a picture of Jesus. Abraham giving his one and only son whom he loved. Who else did that? Isaac is carrying the wood for the sacrifice on his back, just like Jesus would one day carry the wooden cross on his back up the same mountain where he would give his life. And here we see it again. If the people don't get drinkable water soon, what's going to happen? They're all going to die. Right there in the wilderness. In their moment, on the edge, when they're on the edge of death, what is God's answer? A piece of wood. God shows Moses a piece of wood. Do you see this is the gospel? We've all sinned, and the wages of our sin is death. Not physical death. We're all going to die unless Jesus comes back first. We're talking about spiritual death and separation from God for all of eternity in hell. And like the Israelites in the wilderness, unless God did something miraculous, we are incapable of saving ourselves. But in his kindness, in his great love, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, who was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived the perfect life that you and I could never live. 
And then he died a sinner's death on that cross, making payment for all of our sins. He was buried in a tomb. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. And now, because of what Jesus has done on that wooden cross, we are all offered eternal life. We can be forgiven. You can be brought into relationship with God. Just by believing in Jesus. Just like God, I want you to think about this. Just like God pointed Moses to the piece of wood that would provide a way for his people to live, today, God is pointing all of us to the wooden cross, the place where God ultimately provided a way for us to live. His death for us means life. He was whipped for our transgressions. He was bruised for our infirmities. By his stripes, we're healed. Jesus paid for our healing at the cross. And just like the Israelites had water available, you recognize that they had to have the faith to go back to it and to try it. They had to drink it. There was a choice that they had. And likewise, Jesus comes and he says, I am the living water. Anyone who comes to me will live. If we by faith will come to him and receive him as the living water and as our Lord and as our Savior, we will live. But you and I, we each have to make the choice. It's available. God's extending it. But we have our own personal decision that we have to make. And if you haven't made that decision this morning, I want to encourage you to do it. Even right now. If you're feeling compelled in your heart, inside, tell him, God, I believe in you. Please forgive me of my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. You can tell him under your breath. He will hear you. He will save you right now. I believe in you. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. God tells Moses, he says, I'm Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals you. And the great news this morning is that Jehovah Rapha doesn't just heal water, but he heals people. He says, I'm the God who heals. He doesn't say I'm the God who heals water. He says, I'm the God who heals you. And when God heals you, I want you to see that his healing is complete. He cares about every part of your being. So mind, body, spirit, emotions, all of you God is concerned with. Wherever there is bitterness, wherever there is brokenness, where there, wherever there is need for healing... You serve a God who is your healer. We see it in Jesus' ministry. Uh, Mark chapter 2, we read about a guy um, who's paralyzed. He has a group of friends. They want to get him to Jesus. There's a big crowd in the house, crowded around. They can't get him in. And so what do they do? They dig a hole in the roof of some dude's house. Poor guy. They dig a, roof, <laughs> a hole in the guy's roof, and they lower their paralyzed friend down on a mat in front of Jesus. And what is the first thing that Jesus says to him? Your sins are forgiven. I'd be like, that's not why I came. <laughs> I, I kind of like to walk. <laughs> but we see that what's most important to Jesus is our spirit. Because it does no good for Jesus to heal our legs so that we can experience temporary relief now only for us to spend eternity in hell being tortured. And so he tells him first, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, get up, take your mat, and walk. And he gets up, completely healed, walking for the first time on these legs, grabs his mat, and walks out in full view of the crowd that was present. The bitterness of his sin and the bitterness of his paralyzed legs were healed in an instant as he encountered Jesus. On another occasion, Jesus came across a man who was possessed by a legion of demons. This guy we read, he's like naked. He's not in control of his mind or his body. He's cutting himself with stones. He's like crying out. He lives in a cemetery. Like this guy's life is wild. And Jesus, he encounters this guy and he casts the demons out of the man, this, these many, this legion of demons, into a herd of pigs. And then we read at the end of the story that this man is sitting there dressed, thank God, and in his right mind. There was a healing that he, he was healed spiritually as Jesus set him free from demonic oppression and possession. But then he was also healed mentally. When he was not in control of his mind before, God healed his mind. And at the end, he's sitting there in his right mind. Mind, body, spirit. Jehovah Rapha heals you. God cares about your whole being. Maybe you're here this morning and you need God to heal your mind. Maybe you find your mind going towards evil things. Or maybe you have some memories, some terrible things in the past that you just can't seem to escape and they keep replaying in your mind. God will heal you. Um, after God saved me, my life was completely changed. I was saved, but I still had a past. Anybody else? 
I was saved, but I still had a rough past. And my past, it, was, it just kept coming to mind continually. It wasn't that like if I tried, I could remember stuff. It was like, I'm, not, I'm trying to not remember. And all these things keep coming back. And there was all this shame and this guilt and this, I just felt terrible about myself. And so I asked God, I just said, God, please, I need you to heal my mind. I need you to help me to stop thinking about these things. And he did. And I'm telling you, like those, those painful memories, suddenly they just stopped coming back. And when I did remember those things, God removed the guilt and the shame that was associated with them. The pain was no longer there. You have a God who heals your mind. He'll give you the mind of Christ so that you can learn to think God's thoughts and think how he thinks about certain things. If he healed the demonized man, his mind, he'll heal yours. If he healed mine, he'll heal yours. Shortly after that time, I felt like God was calling me to go to Bible college and it felt it was very clear that he wanted me to do that. And so um, I go to Bible college and when I get there, I discover really quickly that I have a problem. I don't know if it was from all the stuff I smoked or what it was, but I couldn't remember anything. I would sit down, I would study for hours and I could not retain anything. And so again, I go to God and I'm like, God, I think you want me to be here, but there's no way I'm going to pass a single class unless you help me because my brain is messed up. So a few days later, I was getting ready to study for a test. I go and sit down at a restaurant called Sherry's. Uh, it's kind of like Denny's uh, with a friend to study. And I had two pages of handwritten notes front and back. So like four pages, basically, that I needed to know for the test. I sit down and I read over everything on my notes, top to bottom, one time. I passed the two pages to my friend, and I was able to recite to them, I'm not making this up, I was able to recite to them every single thing on all four pages, word for word, and tell them where it was on the page. Something happened, I'm telling you, for the rest of my college experience, I never struggled memorizing for a test or for anything. This is Jehovah Rapha. Wherever you are lacking, wherever you need God to touch you, he will. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, my mind is sharp. But maybe for you, you need God to heal your heart. Maybe you've been wounded and there's been some traumatic experiences in your past. You're carrying some deep pain. Maybe it's keeping you from being able to forgive. You're carrying some bitterness. Maybe for you, you find yourself and you're responding in illogical ways to certain things. Like something will happen and you respond in a way that like kind of surprises you. You have this emotional response. It surprises the people around you and they're like, oh my gosh, that person crazy, right? It's because there's some wounds in your heart that you're still carrying that haven't been fully healed yet. A friend of mine that I went to college with, he endured incredible abuse as a child. Um, without going into it, he basically was in his abuse. He would get locked in a closet uh, entire day, days long, and he just shared about how he would be screaming and yelling for somebody to come and help him, and nobody would let him out. And so he struggled for years with just abandonment, with fear, with pain. He was just one of those people you look at him and you can just tell like they're shaken up and they're not all there. But Jehovah Rapha. God healed him and God brought so much healing to his heart that he's now one of the most secure and confident and loving. He's an amazing father now. Like, God completely healed him of all the junk of the past. It wasn't that he forgot all of it, but God brought healing and he removed all the sting and all the pain that was associated with everything in the past. Jehovah Rapha will heal your broken heart. I could share all kinds of stories with you this morning of God healing people in the Bible, but I felt led to share these stories because I believe God wants you to see that that verse is true. That Jehovah Rapha, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still healing people today. And he'll heal your body as well. How many of you this morning would like for God to bring healing to your body? Maybe some pain, some illness, some condition that you're suffering from. This past summer alone, we've witnessed a lot of physical healings. My son's ankles were healed. Carol's bag got healed at camp. Uh, Maddie's shoulder got healed. In my 21 years of following Jesus, I have witnessed more healing miracles than I can count. Everything from migraines being healed to blind eyes being opened. Crazy stuff. People have been prayed for in this room who've been healed of countless things. People who were healed of cancers that had cysts disappear. 
um, issues of bleeding. I prayed for people in this room who came in with crutches and they left carrying them, completely healed. If you're suffering with something in your body, Jehovah Rapha is the God who heals you. And I just want to say this. Many of us know that we know that God heals today, but to be transparent, one of the things that I've struggled with is that everyone, not everybody that I pray for for physical healing gets healed. And the tendency is, when that happens, is I'm just not going to pray for anybody to be healed. Because if I don't ask God for it, then I can't be disappointed. Am I the only one? Um, but one of our values is that faith and hope are our lens. We choose as a community, we are going to guard faith and hope that we're going to believe God, we're going to trust God, and even if there's doubt present, we're going to choose to not let the doubt influence our behavior and inform our actions, but we are going to be people of faith, and we are going to allow that to inform how we respond. And so, we're going to pray for healing this morning, and we're going to believe God, even if it's for the hundredth time that you've asked for that specific thing. We're going to give God the opportunity to move. We're going to move from that place where we're sitting in fear and like, I don't know if I want to have somebody pray for me again. What if I don't get healed? Well, what if you do? Can we ask the other question and be filled with faith and say, what happens if I do get healed? Would it be worth it for you to respond if you actually do get healed? I'm confident God is going to heal people this morning. And we're going to move in faith. We're going to give God the opportunity. And so where do you need to experience Jehovah Rapha this morning? Will you stand with me? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. I want to encourage you to come to him who brings complete healing spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. There's a cross that we have set up over here, and there's some sticky notes and pens on the floor next to it um, or on the edge of the stage. And as we worship, I want to just invite you to come up to the front, come to the cross. You can write on that sticky note whatever it is that is bitter in your life, whatever it is that you want to invite Jehovah Rapha to come in and heal. Um, so if you're stuck in the bitterness of sin this morning, Jehovah Rapha is your healer and he will forgive you. Are you suffering in your thought life? Jehovah Rapha will heal your thoughts, he'll give you the mind of Christ. If you're suffering in your body, come on, Jehovah Rapha is your healer this morning. Are you suffering emotionally? Maybe you're dealing with loss, maybe you're dealing with depression. Jehovah Rapha is here. And even for those who just feel compelled to say this, that those watching online later, that God is with you wherever you are, wherever you're hearing this. And in an act of you bringing that thing to Jesus, remember, when that water, when it came into contact with the wood, there was healing that took place. And so there's nothing magical about this little thing that got screwed together over here. But as a symbol of you saying, I'm bringing this thing to Jesus, I want to invite you to come. And as we worship, just to pick up a sticky note, there's going to be some prayer teams that are available along the wall here. And so if you want somebody to pray for you, uh, you can either come to the prayer teams, you can come to the cross, you can do both. But we want to take a few minutes to respond. And once again, I just want to challenge you. What if God does? Step out of your seat. I know sometimes even, you know, as a, as a leader or as a parent, sometimes you're like, oh, I need to be the one that has it together. But leaders go first. And that means walking in humility and saying, I'm going to, no matter what anybody else thinks, no matter what anybody else, whatever, this is between me and the Lord, and I want to experience God as Jehovah Rapha. I want to invite him into that space wherever I need it. And so would you come and respond? You don't have to wait another second. You can come on up now, um, and we'll worship together.